So welcome people to uh, today's session of exploring the New Testament. We are focusing today on hermeneutics and what that arcane word is all about. Hopefully will become clear as we work through the process today. I invite you to join in the words in italics in our acknowledgement of country. As we gather this morning, we acknowledge the first peoples of the nations where we are as the custodians of the country and a prayer from the Book of Common Worship from about a century ago. So let's pray. Eternal and ever blessed God, the author of our life and the end of our pilgrimage, guide us by your word and spirit amidst all perils and temptations, that we may not wander from the way nor stumble upon dark mountains, but that we may finish our course in safety and come to our eternal rest in you through the grace and merit of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So you all remember some weeks ago, we thought about exegesis, a Greek word, which has been trans transferred into English as a technical term, it comes from the Greek word meaning to lead, bring or draw out from. So exegesis is what we are, when we read the biblical text, what we can see in it and what we want to draw out from it in terms of our um, understanding of, of the biblical text. Hermeneutics also uh, comes from, from the Greek and has been <clears throat> uh, transferred across into English. It comes from a Greek Verb, hermeneuo, meaning I translate or I interpret. And it's interesting that we in English can get both translating and interpreting from the one word. Uh, it comes that that word itself is based on a noun, hermeneus, which is translator or interpreter. And the term <clears throat> became important in ancient Greek because of the philosopher Aristotle, who wrote a treatise called Peri Hermeneas. Uh, this is about 360 before the Common Era. And in Latin, that is known as De Interpretatione, and of course in English, On Interpretation. So there's a lot of scholarly thinking about the process that we're involved in when we preach from Scripture, when we read the Bible and talk about it in uh, Bible study groups. Interpretation. <clears throat> um, there's a German scholar, <clears throat> well, there's two German scholars that are referred to on page 120 of your workbook. One of them is uh, Hans Georg Gadamer, who lived a long and fruitful life, as you can see from the beginning yeah. of the early years of the 21st century, uh, he wrote a mammoth book called Truth and Method. And um, in this book, which I confess to having read all 400 and something or other pages of it in my theology degree, um, he talked about the fusion of horizons. And um, what he was arguing is that... Uh, what Gadama was arguing is that uh, a, um, an interpreter stands at a certain point and looks at what is around them. <clears throat> and you're, uh, you do this every day in life, but when you come to a text, uh, you have a kind of a, a horizon and your horizon might be close. You might be standing and just looking at what's around you, standing out in the garden, just looking at the flowers. Or you might be looking at the trees that are beyond, or you might be looking up into the sky. And so your horizon is uh, set according to how far you're looking and what you're encompassing. If you're looking at the, the flowers in the garden, your horizon is here. Um, if you're looking a bit beyond, it's further out and, and, and so on. <clears throat> so what he says in the process of interpretation is that we, we kind of set the horizon that we 
bring to the task, but also the text. The text is coming from a different point of view. And in a sense, the text is looking at us and the text also has a horizon. The text has the horizon of its immediate historical context. If it's Paul writing to the Romans, then there's the Apostle Paul where he in the in the city where he is, and there's the believers in Jesus in the city of Rome receiving the letter. Um, and though that's the immediate horizon of that text, but it's also part of scripture. So there's a broader horizon, of course, it's set in amongst other letters and gospels and indeed Old Testament narratives and prophetic oracles, etc. So there's a, a lover, another horizon. And then when we stand and start looking at that text, that text, in a sense, looks back at us. And so um, the process of interpretation is the fusion of horizons between ourselves as interpreter and the text, which we kind of personify, if you like, looking back at us. I'm not sure whether that makes sense, but we'll be um, seeking to do a little bit of that process of um, fusion of horizons. So that's the first thing to be said. The second uh, German scholar who's mentioned on page 120 is Karl Barth, who of course is well known for his writing of the church dogmatics, which is a mammoth. Uh, if, we, if we thought that Gadama was writing long at, at sort of four to 500 pages, um, Barth wrote volume after volume after volume after volume um, in his church dogmatics, a whole book sh bookshelf full of books of books just on this topic and um, one of the things that Bart stressed is that the process of interpretation is a participatory event so it's the reader the interpreter participating in a personal encounter with the text and for Bart of course the the, the words of scripture actually encounter us as the words of the living God. And so when we're reading that text, we're actually engaging in a personal encounter with God through those words that are offered to us. So both of those uh, scholars uh, offer us ways of thinking about the interpretative process, the process of interpretation, the fusion of horizons and an event in which we participate interpretation is a participatory event and you may have seen uh, you may encounter this in your reading uh, sometimes there's reference to a, a method of interpretation called reader response criticism which is really um, naming that interpretation is a process of conversation and dialogue the text and the reader engage in a conversation back and forth so what I bring to the text when I come as reader of the text shapes what I see and hear in the text. The text offers words to me and I bring my expectations and presuppositions. And so we have a conversation back and forth between those words and um, my hopes and anticipations and, and discoveries. Um, so reader response criticism is, is a term that's sometimes used. Now in the books on page 121, there is um, some, some, something that is said about uh, what is called the hermeneutical spiral or indeed what we might call the learning spiral. Um, and that is that uh, this um, transformational, this participatory event can become a transformational process because as we engage in the back and forth of the conversation, or this image is as we enter into the spiral, we start to um, go around, come around. Um, we notice something, we ask a question that poses, uh, that, that sets us off exploring something else. Then we discover something else and that raises more questions. So it's like the text and the reader, myself and the Bible are talking with one another. Um, so, so learning is pretty much like that. All, all kinds of learning and all kinds of growing takes place in this kind of spiral process. <clears throat> so um, here's, here's one way of describing it. An event happens. You experience that event. You react to the event. 
as you think about the event, maybe you talk to other people about it, you start to learn from the event. And because of that learning, it impacts on your life and you are changed by that event. So each of us has had many, many millions of events in our lives. Some of those events have been very striking and very important. We have reacted to them. We've thought about them. We've talked about them. We've learned from them. They have, they have changed us. We could say that about this year, couldn't we? About yes. um, the COVID. Um, here's another way of describing that process. With the event, um, we might like to think what warnings or cautions were there in relation to the event? How did it feel to experience that event? What consequences were there in the event for me? How did my behavior change? What did I learn? And we go through that kind of process in our minds and we come back to the event and maybe we start to see it in, in a, a different light. Um, so, so this applies not only to reading the Bible, but to all kinds of encounter experiences that we have in life. So that's the spiral. And then what you have in the book is transposing on that, the actual uh, hermeneutic process of reading a text. We open a text, we read the text, we reflect about the text. There are some questions that are raised, maybe raised by a Bible reading guide that we're reading or a commentary, maybe questions that are raised in our own mind. We explore those questions. We talk to other people about them. We think about what we might say in relation to those questions. That leads us hopefully to deeper understanding and new insights. And from that, if we integrate those understandings and insights into our whole being, we, we experience personal growth and transformation from the very process of biblical interpretation. So this, this kind of deepens the level of what's going on when we engage with a uh, biblical text. Now, I want you to think about um, the spiral and I want you to think about how engaging, how your experience of engaging in biblical study, in preparing to deliver sermons, in reading material for this course, uh, in Bible study groups that you've been a part of, how it might be an experience of spiraling for you. And particularly on page 121, there are, there are two questions. Um, think about how your experience of the Bible might be kind of like an upward spiral, an upward movement. That's the green part of the, uh, of, of the picture that's, that's there on the screen. What does it look like when you experience an upward movement, an upward spiral in your study of the Bible? And also alongside of that, have there been times when you've gotten into thinking about the Bible and got hooked into questions and it feels like you're being taken into a downward movement? Um, and the questions are, what does that downward movement look like? What may be some of the reasons that the movement may, may be perceived as downward? So thinking about the spiral and think about whether it's a spiral that takes you upward or a spiral that takes you um, downward. Um, so we're going to just spend a few minutes in, in small groups uh, looking at uh, those questions. Just, just share with one another how these ideas uh, resonate with you. Welcome back. Now we're going to be looking at uh, what appears from page 123 onward in your book and think about uh, what is called the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Uh, this was actually a term <clears throat> that was invented by Albert Outler, who was an American scholar, uh, prominent last century in uh, Wesleyan studies, studies about uh, John Wesley. Um, the Wesleyan quadrilateral refers to four sources which are used to guide our theological reflection and our interpretation processes. Um, the bottom left-hand corner of the screen shows you those four sources in four square boxes, a nice, neat quadrilateral kind of arrangement. Outler in a, actually came to um, 
uh, be sorry <laughs> that regret that he had uh, coined this phrase because for for a start Wesley never actually used the term it's a, it's outless term about how Wesley operated and secondly he thought that it was too kind of four square it was too kind of uh, clunky mm -hmm. uh, but we're going to think a little bit about how scripture tradition experience and reason relate in the process of interpretation and one um, important um, corrective I guess that's been made to this uh, model has been to say that scripture actually sits over the other three tradition reason experience that scripture shapes informs and guides um, how we relate to the tradition how we use our reason and how we understand our experience and of course in terms of the the, the Christian life how we live our faith is informed by all four of these factors, scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Uh, this is another way of um, portraying the, um, the relationship. The larger circle is scripture, and within that larger circle, three overlapping circles of uh, tradition, reason, and experience. And this is a a way of kind of portraying it that, that I quite like. So that when we come to scripture, we're looking at scripture, but we're also asking questions and engaging in terms of reason, tradition, and experience. Um, the first element in the quadrilateral is the living core of Christian faith revealed in scripture, the sole foundational source for our um, understanding of Christian life. Wesley is, is uh, quoted as having said, in all cases, the church is not to be judged by the scripture. Sorry, the church is to be judged by the scripture, not the scripture by the church. And scripture is the best expounder of scripture. So the best way to understand it is carefully to compare scripture with scripture and thereby learn the true meaning of it. In my sense is that Wesley kind of overreached a bit there because yes, we are to be judged by scripture, but our understanding of scripture is in fact shaped by who we are as church, as people of faith. Nevertheless, Wesley's giving a, a, a kind of a priority in the whole um, question of how we understand our Christian life to scripture. So we know from what we've been doing in this course, <clears throat> Now, when we come to scripture, we have a whole lot of questions we might like to put to scripture. What, if we have a, a question in mind, what are the passages that speak to that question, that, that speak to that issue? How are the passages similar to or different from other passages? Do other passages say something different? Is there one passage amongst all that we're thinking about that has more authority? Does scripture agree across a variety of texts? Is one passage in scripture based on another part of scripture? What was the original context for the passages? How are we to understand that people might have understood them when they were written? Is the context of the text unique to its time or can it relate to now? So there's a whole lot of questions to ask um, <clears throat> about scripture passages. Alongside scripture then, um, the second element in the Wesleyan quadrilateral is that doctrine, um, how we understand our faith needs to be in keeping with orthodox christian tradition with orthodoxy throughout the the centuries wesley in fact said do not undervalue traditional evidence let it have its place and due honor it is highly serviceable in its kind and in its degree um, he does not undervalue the tradition but just like we engage critically with scripture so we also need to engage critically with the tradition so when we're thinking about a passage of scripture, we might ask what traditions or cultures did this passage of scripture come out? What was its context? What culture or traditions is it speaking to? Of course, that means that we start looking at commentaries to see what they say about the passage. If we're getting into it in great detail, we might like to start thinking, what did the early church, what did, did, did leaders in the early church say about this passage of scripture over the next few centuries? What have other theological writers said about this over the centuries that follow? 
And then um, uh, how does this passage sit within the traditions that I have in my church and the traditions that I know in my own culture? So traditions, uh, traditions of the passage, traditions of interpretation, traditions of my current context. Those fact that those questions are factors to be borne in mind in thinking about scripture. The third element in the Wesleyan quadrilateral is experience that the truth that is set forth in scripture and passed down by tradition is actually lived and experienced in the life of Christian people. So the, the value of experience, it's not just what people tell you you have to believe, it's how does that belief make sense to you in terms of your own personal experience. Um, John Wesley is, is quoted as saying, what the scriptures promise, I enjoy. In other words, the promise of the scripture comes to reality in uh, the life that I am living. You can see two contrasting images here about how <clears throat> um, experience might uh, shape how we approach scripture. What experience did the passage originally refer to was originally being addressed by the biblical text that we're thinking about? What do you think the passage meant to the original readers and hearers? How applicable is the experience written about for us? Is it something that would only be applicable to the original hearers or readers, or can we apply it in our own times? How does the experience in this passage compare to your experience of God? when a prophet or an evangelist or a letter writer is talking about how they understand God to be at work, how does that correlate with or not match up with your own experience of God? How can your personal life experiences inform your reflection on the issue? So this, as well as asking questions of scripture, thinking about the traditions that are carried by the scripture, what about the experiences that are reflected in scripture and that the experience that you, you bring to scripture interpretation? <clears throat> and then the fourth element in the Wesleyan quadrilateral is uh, reason uh, that every doctrine must be able to be defended rationally. Wesley said, of what excellent use is reason if we would either understand ourselves or explain to others? those living oracles. So we have been given a brain. We have been given a brain to use. And when we read the Bible, we're of course using our brain to help us read the words, but we also need to use our brain to think rationally, clearly, carefully about what those texts are saying. What could have been the thinking of the writer of this passage? What purpose would they have had in writing what they did? If the scriptures are silent or don't speak much on a particular issue, why is that? And can we infer anything from that, from that silence? What are the social and scientific resources that we're able to use to inform our thinking? Is the issue being addressed in scripture relevant as relevant then as relevant, it was relevant then, is it still something that is relevant now or has the world changed um is is something that said 2000 years ago really something that still applies in the current time that's a, a really important question for us to grapple with in scripture so what other differences frame the issue between the time the text was written and the time now that we're reading the text um so <clears throat> just um some some comments about those four sources, tradition, uh, scripture, tradition, reason, and experience, you can start at any one point. It's best then draw in the other sources as you go along. Tradition has both the, the broad global sense of Christian tradition, but also your immediate tradition, your local church, your denomination, your Christian, the culture of Christianity that you've experienced. Um, experience refers to your experiences. All of these sources make up the way that we understand and live out our faith. All of the sources exist within the constructs of society and the various cultures we experience. So all of that 
together, we live our faith in relation to scripture, tradition, reason, and experience within the cultural context that we're familiar with. I'm going to stop at this point and just ask whether anyone has any questions before we take our, or, or anything you want to say before we take our next step forward. <laughs> so, John, what I suppose it did make me think that sometimes mm -hmm. we can hear of uh, some rather unpleasant things happening due to people's interpretation of how they see things in scripture, their experiences and what have you. Sure, yeah. And we can kind of analyze and assess that in terms of the different weight that they might be giving yes. within those four different sources. That it becomes a very helpful, I think, analytical tool for thinking about what's going on when, when someone seems to become so dogmatic about a point yes. of view that they just yeah. can't hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Something that came up in our little group was <clears throat> that, that God had told Joshua to eliminate all the Moabites, women, children, and everybody, everything, animals, everything. You know, was this a downward spiral or an upward spiral? Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. That yes, sometimes, you... sometimes reading the scripture can take us into that downward spiral of really questioning what is going on and is this really what our faith is about? Um, John, I just had a question. Go, Henriette. Oh, it's okay, Jen. Go ahead. Oh, okay. um, about what, can you um, describe the downward spiral? I was just thinking that was more of a, um, you start with a, a belief, but then you, it takes you back into scripture. Well. The downward spiral, but I wasn't sure. I, we, our group was, um, yeah. I'm talking about other things being a downward spiral, like a negative thing. Yeah, well, I think the image is deliberately ambiguous because it invites you to think of going down as getting caught in the depths of something murky, or you can spiral down in terms of deepening your understanding and going okay. down to the roots of something. So the, the very image itself, I think, has you know negative and positive connotations. Yeah. I was I was thinking about you know I mean from the scriptures the Holocaust was started because of interpreting the scriptures about you know the Jews killing Jesus and you know having to mm. um, avenge them avenge them somehow and uh, it's how the hatred towards Jews has started and you know sometimes it's still ongoing so is that a downward spiral or an upward spiral? Mm -hmm. Yes, very good question, Henrietta. <laughs> yeah. Depends where you sit, Henrietta. That's right. <laughs> and there were, there were cultural, there were things from the tradition, there were things from history, there were cultural experiences that fed into the way German, uh, the, the German mm. culture then started relating to, to Jewish faith and mm. German leaders then started developing that particular mm. savage response to, mm. to Jews. Yeah. Yeah, I tend to think it, in that instance, it was more situation at the time, and they used scriptures to underline their agenda and to justify it, um, which happens a lot. And that probably is my question on it is where how does that affect us as christians i mean it it has to affect us when you see people use scripture to vilify someone or to mm -hmm. beat someone over the head for who they are or what they believe or don't believe and i see that as really difficult and there's plenty of scriptures there that can be misinterpreted and used for that and so we were discussing about christ I'm feeling like the horizon is often where where are we looking? Are we looking at that? Are we looking at the scripture? And a lot of people just look at the scripture and go, right, okay, it says here that homosexuality is bad. And yeah. they're going to go, well, I mean, let's take that as an example. But then if you look and lift your eyes to a greater horizon, the scriptures in it indicate otherwise. And there's also scriptures that say things like mercy triumphs of judgment 
um, mm. love mm. is a fulfillment of the law. So in raising our her eyes to a greater horizon, we conceive it text as part of the whole. Whereas if you're just looking at a small bit of text, it's very easy to be caught in that small bit of text and not really put it where it belongs. That was sort of what I was thinking on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Drew. I, I'm wondering, Patricia, were you trying to say something before? No? No, no. I think Enid was. Oh, no. I've got the... Enid was trying to oh, say something. I just, I just said it depends where you're sitting. I mean, even in the Jews and the, um, the, the Germans, Germans would think they were on an upward spiral. The Jews would think they were on a downward spiral. <laughs> that's true. Yes, that's right. It depends yeah. where you're sitting. Yeah. How you would perceive it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Let me um, now turn your thoughts to the Uniting Church and the basis of union. And we're going to look at a particular paragraph in the basis of union. And the question for you to have in mind as I run through this paragraph is where do you hear each element identified in paragraph 11 of the basis of union? Where do you hear it refer to scripture? Where to tradition? Where does it refer to reason? Where does it refer to experience? It won't necessarily use those specific words, but where are each of these concepts of the Wesleyan quadrilateral to be found? Paragraph 11. The Uniting Church, says paragraph 11, acknowledges that God has never left the church without faithful and scholarly interpreters of scripture. The best tradition, isn't it? Periods. Or without those who have reflected deeply upon and acted trustingly in obedience to God's living word. So um, we're already getting, I'm already getting responses. Is that right? Yep. Yes. <laughs> we've got tradition. Experience. We've got, yeah, said experience. We've got experience. Scripture. Yeah. Reason. Reason. We can already see those four in the first yes. sentence of the paragraph. It goes on with another three sentences or another four sentences, actually. Three of them are up there, and I want to look at each of them in turn. In particular, the Uniting Church enters into the inheritance, and that word, I guess, flag tradition, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. The inheritance of literary, historical, and scientific inquiry, which has characterized recent centuries, and give thanks for the knowledge of God's ways with humanity, which are open to an informed faith. So, of course, what's happened in recent centuries is that since what's called the Enlightenment, uh, our understanding of history, our understanding of science have both developed in a certain direction, at least within the Western world. There's been a, a very yeah. strong orientation in that way. And that means using our minds, our brains, reason. It also means engaging with tradition. And I love that that uh, phrase at the at the end of this uh, sentence of God's ways with humanity, which are an understanding, a knowledge of God's ways with humanity, which are open to an informed faith. So that's both how we encounter God and how we think about God. Um, that's both experience and reason. Yep. The United Church lives within a worldwide fellowship of churches in which it will learn to sharpen its understanding of the will and purpose of God by contact with contemporary thought. Mm. But what elements of the quadrilateral do we see in this sentence? Reason. Experience. Reason, experience. Yes. Yeah. Well, even tradition. And tradition, yeah. The Worldwide Fellowship of Churches means we're, we're engaging with Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Anglican, Baptist, Pentecostal, each of which has their own stream of tradition that, that comes 
as well as Protestants, yeah. And contact with contemporary thought means the whole way in which we reason about our faith. Mm. Within that fellowship, the Uniting Church also stands in relation to contemporary societies in ways which will help it to understand its own nature and mission. Uh, we're part of societies. Societies have their own culture. And in Australia, we know that we now have elements reflected from many different societies, that is, many different cultures. We call ourselves a multicultural country because people have come to this land from all kinds of societies, bringing all kinds of cultural practices, which we have, by and large, sought to welcome and um, value and incorporate. And, and this sentence, I think, is a really interesting sentence. How do we see contemporary societies? How do we see the world in which we stand? One way of looking at the world is to say, the world is a scary place. It's full of problems. The world is a place of evil. It's caught in darkness. So we, as Christian people, need to keep ourselves apart from all that is bad in the world. I'm assuming that you may have an understanding of that perspective on the world, that you may know people that say that very strongly, that you may identify with elements of that for yourself. The world's a scary place. Alongside that, another way of thinking about contemporary society and the current world is the yeah. world is a sacred place. God is at work in the world. We can hear and see God in our music, in our books, in our cultures, in the natural world. Put those two side by side. They're two very different ways of looking at the world. So the question for the church posed by this sentence is how do we see ourselves in relation to contemporary societies? Do we engage with what's going on in the world and recognize it's a scary, problematic, evil, dark place and want to stand away from it? Or do we recognize that the world's a sacred place in which God's at work and we rejoice in ways that God comes to us, not just through church, Bible, religious ways? I think, that's I, think it, yes, I think it boils down to faith. Faith? Yes. If you have faith in God, then surely the world is not a scary place. It's a sacred place. Right. If you have no faith and no um, prospect of, of whatever, um, no positive prospect, then surely that's the downward spiral. Yes. If, if, we, if we're going to keep ourselves small, that's bad in the world. I'm reminded that G.K. Chesterton, in answer to a, a, a poll that the Times of London uh, was conducting, asking for, question, asking for answers to the question, what's wrong with the world? Chesterton wrote in and said, dear sirs, I am yours faithfully. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice, Fred Derek. Very nice. <laughs> yes. well, I think, why can't we put it together? The world is a scary thing. We want to be part of it. But are, we, are, we any better than, are we any better than anybody else in the world? Goodness. Well, no. yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. That's why we need the cross. That's, a, that's why we need. Right. <laughs> yes. No, like I was saying, in the world is a scary place. And so it's all, it's all evil, but we also have God, we have the faith, like Max said, to be part of it, not exclude ourselves from it. Right. Mm. And sure. hope for the best kind of thing. Yes. yes. And certainly this paragraph of the Basis of Union is, is really inviting and challenging us to do that, mm -hmm. to continue to engage with and be part of and, and interact with and try and shape the world rather than run away and say it's too terrible. Yeah. I mean, if we're living in the kingdom now, um, which the scriptures say we are, right. we're almost walking with our, our feet in two worlds. And yeah. so there will be things that, like, for example, uh, the recent arrest of all the pedophile ring, um, that 
reminded me of how much evil there is mm. in the world. I mean, so, I tend to go on the, the other way, but that reminded me. And yet you can't dismiss everything of the world as being evil because God is in everything. So it's a, for me, it's a strange sort of dichotomy where yeah. you are, it's a balancing act, really. Yes, yeah, that's right. So just to um, round out paragraph 11, paragraph 11 ends with these sentences, the Uniting Church thanks God for the continuing witness and service of evangelist, of scholar, of prophet, and of martyr. And we give thanks for evangelists who, who challenge people and offer people the good news. We give thanks for scholars who write and, and push our thinking about issues. We give thanks for prophets, stand up, call out injustice, call us to a better way of being. It's a bit harder to give thanks for martyrs. Uh, it might be good to, to see evangelist, scholar or prophet as a good role model for us. I'm not sure how many of us actually want to take on the role of martyr <laughs> as a role model, but we can at least give thanks or martyrs throughout history who have held fast to what they understand the faith to be and have paid dearly for that. And those who are still dying in, in, in other countries. That's right. There is, there's still ongoing persecution and martyrdom. Absolutely, Derek. Yeah. And we pray as a church that we may be ready when occasion demands to confess the Lord in fresh words and deeds. And that's the very process that anyone who preaches from scripture is doing you don't just we don't just read scripture and say okay that's the bible we read the scripture we listen to it and we say okay now what does that mean for us we're confessing the lord in our own fresh words and hopefully then in our deeds as well uh, so what are the sources that help you to hold to an informed faith? Scripture, reason, tradition, experience. All of those are reflected in various ways in that paragraph, paragraph 11 of the Basis of Union, that invites us to have an informed faith. Uh, what we're going to do now for about 20 minutes is um, a test run of... Uh, of thinking about each of these scripture tradition experience and reason on pages 126 and 127 um, it invites you to uh, think about the ethical issue of whether or not it is right for us to hurt others and to think about how we would go about um, looking at that question uh, can I suggest that you might like to take, I've got uh, on the screen, I've got a series of biblical passages. Let me suggest, suggest that you take Galatians 5, 13 to 15, and Jude 3 to 7. Is that okay? Galatians 5, 13 to 15, and Jude 3 to 7. And think about how you would grapple with those passages when you're thinking about this question, is it right for us to hurt others? What do those passages say? How do we um, bring tradition, experience and reason to bear in when we're uh, looking at them? So I'll let you have uh, 20 minutes or so, and then we'll come back for the last part of our um, session. Uh, welcome back everyone. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. How did you go with scripture, tradition, reason, and experience? It's all too hard, and you need to sort it out for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's saying two different things, as far as I can read. So, beg your pardon, Peter? It's saying two almost mutually exclusive principles. <laughs> In those two passages? Yeah. Definitely mm, yeah. paradoxical. Paradoxical, yes. Well, of course, the thing with a paradox is it holds holds together things that are in tension. 
we actually, they were really different <laughs> passages. Yes. And um, not what I expected. Thanks, John. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah, that's good because, as we all said, it challenged us. And in the end, I think we all came to a place where we felt that, that if there was a common thread that could be found in both those passages, it was that hurting others hurts yourself and it hurts those around you. Mm. And it's destructive. And that's mm. what we came to. Mm within that, those two very different passages. Oh, okay. I suppose yeah. there's a big difference between hurting someone and disciplining someone. Like, I think there's still a place for discipline. Hmm. I think it's the method of discipline that's probably yeah. an issue. Yes. And, of course, discipline suggests that reason is involved. It's yes. not punishment, it's discipline. Well, yes. surely maybe also it can be seen as consequences. If you're hurting people, there are consequences. And that's, I think, what we were finding within our understanding of those two passages. Mm. There were consequences in the Jude passage and there were consequences in the Galatians passage. And anything we do, we, we, we act from love or from a, a sinful base of behaviour where we hurt others, there's consequences. Mm. And, and so those, that's what we, that's the place we came to is how hurting others has such an almost viral effect, which it spreads out and it hurts yourself or the person hurting or it hurts the people around them or around the person that's doing the hurting. There's always consequences and just inherent in that is a, the form of, you know, thinking where it's punishment. Um, mm. Punishment as opposed to the discipline. We, we, yeah. decided, we decided that, that loving your neighbour didn't mean you had to like him necessarily, but you yeah. had to act in love. That love was, a, it was an active thing, mm. not, a, not, a, not an emotional thing. And that hopefully, uh, if you... If you acted towards him love and, and didn't go around hurting him but that you may eventually get to like him or her mm. well discipline can be an act of love if, if you yes. have to pick someone yes. up mm. Mm. to stop them hurting someone else that's an act of love and it's an act of love for the person doing being disciplined and for the people that they're hurting mm. and of course the warning that that if you if you keep keep it up, you might destroy yourselves because you you become like raving lions or something other. What was that? We were looking at punishment coming through that you know quite strong, and then we looked at tradition, and has your church how has your church responded to this in the past? And churches in our lifetime did punish very much so, and we went down to nitty gritty. But we were talking about children born out of wedlock and the treatment of those children, you know, second-class citizens and taken away and always had this label and the church had that as well. And that was very I, much I, I, think, I think legally they're still bastards, aren't they? I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, we were just talking it's about tradition. Term, but I think legally they are still considered to be bastards. <laughs> oh, dear. I don't think that's ever changed. Mm. But we're, we were just looking at has your, how has your church responded to this in the past, you know, like punishment for being doing the wrong things and stuff. And it's been pretty strong mm. and quite recent history, really. I mean, I can remember it. So We had fun uh, considering the, the action of the church, the um, university council, the students council, trying to make the evangelical union allow non-Christians onto their board. John, you, you realise that our, our co-chair was once co-chair co of the EU? Yes, yes, I did know that, yes. <laughs> well, Enid brought up about child abuse in the church. And in, that's an instance where really there wasn't, it wasn't discipline. It wasn't discipline at all. It was covered up. Yes. And it was allowed to fester and it was allowed to hurt. Yeah. And eventually it did hurt the church. You know, and what they thought they could keep a lid on. You can't keep a lid on hurting others, especially mm, good point. to that yeah. massive degree. And sooner or later, there's consequences. Yeah. And so that 
as Enid pointed out, related very much back to that passage in Galatians about the need to discipline that. Let me offer you at this point a couple of reflections. What we've been doing is um, engaging in hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is both the process of interpretation and it's also thinking about that process, thinking about the ways that we interpret texts. And so in your discussion, you were engaging with text, but we have been also thinking about how is it that we come at those texts? I'm not sure whether you're aware, hopefully you're aware that in the Uniting Church, as well as the basis of union adopted in the 70s for the union of the church in 1977, it's a statement to the nation that was adopted by the first assembly. And it talks about a Christian responsibility to society yeah. involving us in social and national affairs. And it actually has things to say. So this is part of our tradition, I suppose, in relation to doing harm or not doing harm to others. We recognise responsibilities as a branch of the church within Southeast Asia and the Pacific. We affirm the basic Christians and values that we hold, such as the importance of every human life, the need for integrity, proclamation of truth and justice, the rights for participation in decision making, religious liberty, personal dignity, concern for the welfare of the whole human race. So this is part of our tradition and these are shaped by scriptural stories and scriptural injunctions uh, that have, were put together in the statement to the nation. So this speaks directly into the whole question about how we relate to other people, mm. whether we hurt, whether we harm, and, and particularly uh, a commitment to seek the correction of injustices, eradicating poverty and racism, equal op educational opportunities, adequate health care, freedom of speech, employment or dignity and unemployment things that were topical in 1977 and remain topical throughout society, opposing mm. discrimination, challenging values that emphasize acquisitiveness and greed, mm. encouraging a higher standard, challenging values that encourage a higher standard of living and the widening gap between the rich and the poor, and the statement about um, energy and the environment in terms of human rights adopted in 1977 still and even more so mm. really important for the present time and uh, a conclusion that affirms our allegiance is to god and it's god's judgment on the policies and actions of all nations that is ultimately holding us to account and so we pledge ourselves to hope and work for a nation whose goals are not guided by self-interest, but by concern for the welfare of persons everywhere, the family of the one God made known in Jesus of Nazareth, the one who gave his life for others. In the spirit of his self-giving love, we seek to go forward. A really inspiring statement, I believe, from the first assembly of the church that still holds good today. Mm. So, uh, and that then, Having read that, then going back and looking at scripture passages and saying, what are the what are the principles and what are the, the guidance that come? Okay, today's been a case study in hermeneutics. Um, thank you for engaging in the process. You might feel like you've got more thinking to do about hurting and harming others, but um, the purpose was not to conclude, come to a conclusion, but to think about the process that we use as we engage in a, in a difficult question like that. Two things about the future. Next week is session 12, and we're moving on to later letters in the name of Paul. So that's from a page 129 onwards in the book. And you might like to think a bit about or do a bit of reading there. And I'll send you out an email with um, a couple of the blog links that I think you might find pertinent for that.